Okay, uh, now today uh, we will uh, continue with the discussion regarding the sampling of images. We started uh, with one dimensional sampling and it was uh, the sampling concept in one dimension. It's 1D signals, we started with that. And I have briefly mentioned about um, resampling or downsampling concepts. And I even asked you a question like this. If you sample the continuous function with a sampling period of, let's say, capital T, and then downsample it by a factor of something, let's say two, that is equal to, the output is equal to directly sampling uh, the continuous time signal uh, with a sampling period of two times capital T. Okay, they correspond to the same thing. And from that equality, can you find the relation between uh, the uh, downsampled signal and the not downsampled signal? So what are the Fourier relations between the continuous time sampled and downsampled signals? How do they all go along? So today's, uh, or let me open a new page because I need, a, I need some more free space. Uh, so today we will be discussing more like a discrete resampling. Let me put it as a title. Discrete resampling. The resampling is uh, mostly downsampling, but upsampling, etc. They're uh, also possible. Upsampling is an easy one. And I have now noticed that uh, I must very briefly show you, so I'm rolling back, going to the previous uh, page. Uh, we didn't talk about how to make uh, discrete time to continuous time conversion and what are the limitations of those things. Perhaps I should first uh, a little bit talk about that one um, before going to the discrete domain completely. We know how to make sampling and by sampling, as a result of sampling, we come up with uh, this formula. If you sample your signal um, with uh, a sampling period of capital T or a sampling frequency of 2 pi over capital T, very briefly, it uh, would make um, the frequency axis, the omega axis, to be scaled by capital T, to be divided by uh, capital T. So, um, and we also come up with 2 pi over capital T replicas. Um, so this is the formula that I'm showing you right now. Is... Uh, the formula that we get for sampling our um, signal. And it makes everything to be 2 pi periodic in the discrete domain. If you think about uh, omega domain, lowercase omega, discrete time, we have omega and that is 2 pi periodic. And in continuous time, which corresponds to multiplication with impulses, then uh, we are going to represent it with an uppercase omega, and that will be 2 pi over capital T, which is the sampling frequency periodic. So uh, the discrete time to uh, continuous time, or digital to analog, sort of, uh, conversion runs like this. You start from your discrete time signals Fourier transform, which was 2 pi periodic. Let's briefly show it like this. Something like this, 4 pi. It is periodic to the left and to the right on the frequency axis. <coughs> now what you have to do is you have to first uh, use capital T or the knowledge of the sampling period or the sampling frequency, knowing either of them uh, would do because they correspond to the same thing. The other one is 
uh, two pi over capital T, the sampling frequency. What you do is um, you divide the uh, uppercase omega axis uh, by capital T and say that omega is equal to omega over capital T. You first do this and from there you come up with a new shape uh, which is the same shape but just scaled according to the uppercase omega axis again it's consisting of triangles clearly these points uh, the ending points of these triangles will be uh, different numerically different because they are scaled versions of one another like this and now it becomes periodic with 2 pi over capital T, like this, 2 times 2 pi over capital T, 0 is the same. And then uh, what you need to do is just apply a low pass filter Uh, with a cutoff frequency that is, this is by the way the sample, uh, the sampling frequency omega sub s. The cutoff frequency of the low pass filter that you apply is omega s over two. Okay, you apply this low pass filter, you, or you try to estimate some kind of a, a low pass filter, and uh, you isolate the individual triangular shape in the uh, in the center part. This part would correspond to the Fourier transform of the uh, analog signal. Okay. So that's how we do digital to analog conversion. We just um, we just have to consider uh, the stretching uh, of the uh, signal. We have to stretch it. Stretch it not uh, with a separation of ones in, in the digital signal or in the discrete time signals, the separations of the samples were ones. Uh, that also means that it's like from converting a discrete time signal consisting of discrete samples like this like this, which are separated by one on the axis of n to um, real impulses like this. And the separations between these real impulses are not one, but uh, they are capital T. Something like this, okay? So this is capital T, this is two capital T, three T, four T, five T, six T, on the real time axis, okay? From here to here, we first make the conversion. And after that, we apply the low pass filter to this. And the low pass filtering makes the isolation of the triangle in the Fourier domain. So, uh, and that is the uh, Fourier transform of the original signal. So we must come up with the um, original um, continuous time signal. If you apply an ideal rectangular uh, Fourier domain low pass filter, a box shape on the Fourier axis, that would correspond to, uh, well, that is a multiplication in the frequency domain. You multiply, the rectangular box shape with the uh, replica of triangles. So you are multiplying Fourier transforms. And from signal processing, we know that in time domain, it corresponds to um, convolution of two time signals. One of them is the inverse Fourier transform of uh, those replicated triangles, which is here, this one. The other one, let me put it in red, is the convolution with it, uh, with the uh, with those impulses, with the inverse Fourier transform of the rectangular 
box shape. What is the inverse Fourier transform of a rectangular shape? It is a sync signal. The sync signal is like sine uh, pi t over pi t, or sine x over x kind of signal, which is decaying towards the tails as uh, time increases towards plus and minus infinity. And it exhibits oscillations. If you precisely choose this cutoff frequency to be omega s over two, like this, then some magical things happen. Let me first draw the, these impulses again, because I am gonna show it on top of these impulses. like this. Um, so the time signal, which I'm going to convolve with these impulses will be acting like this. And remember that when you convolve a shape with an impulse with any of these impulses, uh, that shape is uh, repeated at the position of the impulse. That's how you convolve with an impulse. You carry the, the sync shape, which is the, uh, the shape from the filter, and you convolve it with one of the impulses, it means you're carrying to the position of the impulse. The first um, impulse was this, and it is scaled by the amplitude or the, of the impulse, of course. So, uh, and when omega s, uh, when the cutoff frequency is selected as omega s over two, it would correspond to a sync shape which looks like this. This is a sync shape. Of course, it's going to the left as well. And when you multiply uh, with the other impulse at, at capital T, not at zero, but at capital T, it would look like this. And with this impulse, when you convolve, it would look like this. With this impulse, it's gonna look like this. It may look a little bit messy. With the other impulse, it's gonna look like this. Uh, the smaller ones will be, of course, um, shorter in magnitude impulses. Uh, let me briefly indicate this one and this one too. The, uh, the critical idea about this is that these points are always the zero crossings of every uh, sink shape that uh, does not come from uh, the, the sink with that origin. There is one sink at that point, with the origin at that point, and all the other sinks, all the tails of the other sinks will make a zero crossing here at these points, which makes sure that the value at these points correspond to the of the impulses at these points. Uh, the the others uh, will just contribute will be contributed from all the other things. But when you combine all the other contributions, it will be like an interpolation. Like this. So the summation of all these infinitely many uh, sync shapes will be uh, just an interpolation, a smooth interpolation that is tracing the peaks. And that is the digital to analog conversion. In fact, this uh, green dashed uh, or dotted shape, the interpolation is the ideal shape that is exactly the same as the original uh, continuous time signal, which we sampled in the beginning. And that is um, due to the fact that when you crop in the Fourier domain with an ideal uh, rectangular box shape, 
you will exactly get this original triangular shape. Except maybe uh, I, I didn't uh, consider the, the peak value. The peak value is just an amplification factor. We don't care about that. We're just caring about the shapes. And this blue triangle shape is the same shape that we start with in the very beginning of this page. Is it here? Let's see. Yes, it's here, this one. Uh, I hope the, yeah, this, this one. So this triangle is precisely recovered. Therefore, these um, interpolations must be equal to exactly the uh, same original uh, signal. Clearly, it's not possible to do it uh, in, in practice because sync wave is not a causal waveform. It extends from minus infinity to plus infinity and computers cannot do that or no electronics can do that. So people just don't do this kind of an interpolation called sync interpolation. They write the name of this one. This is the sync interpolation, which is theoretically the ideal one. But of course we cannot do that because of it being non-causal. So I said that, that we just do some other interpolations, which would spoil the ideality. That corresponds to a filter in the Fourier domain, which is not uh, like this red box, but it has different shapes. For example, if you use a, a, a zero order hold interpolation uh, for converting digital to analog, that would have the Fourier transform shape, not like this rectangular box, the, it, but it would be the rectangular boxes uh, Fourier transform. Because in time domain now it's a rectangular box. So it's Fourier transform would be sync. If you multiply with a sync, I don't know, maybe it's gonna look like, um, like this. So some uh, portions from the right-hand side and left-hand side triangles will be contaminating uh, the result. And uh, the intermediate uh, triangle shape will also be a little bit spoiled, disturbed, distorted because of this uh, non-uniform multiplication. It's this shape of the sink. If you uh, do a linear interpolation, that would correspond to a shape a, a, an interpolation shape in the time domain for a triangle. So if, when you convolve impulses with triangles, that would make linear interpolation. And uh, the Fourier transform of a triangle is, uh, a triangle is a rectangle convolution with a rectangle. So its Fourier transform is sync times sync, which is sync square. And sync square is um, something like this which decays faster. And uh, in the uh, zero, around the zero frequency or around the low frequencies, it is a little bit flatter than uh, sync itself. Sync square is flatter. So you are uh, making a better interpolation if you do a linear interpolation, but it's not as good as still the uh, sync interpolation, which is theoretically the best, but it's impossible to do. So this is how we, uh, basically to uh, digital to analog conversion. This digital to analog conversion, unfortunately or fortunately, is not a great issue in digital image processing if uh, you're talking about displays because the displays are already consisting of lamps, uh, very small millimeter or uh, micron size lamps. Um, Therefore, it is uh, usually our eyes that makes the uh, interpolation, the sync interpolation sort of thing. We just look at these lamps stacked by, side by side like the, that, like the screen that you're looking right now. And we um, convert it to a smooth uh, surface-like shape in our brain or due to, uh, due to our eyes. That's uh, how we perceive. So this kind of a digital to analog converter deliberate conversion is not necessary in image processing. But theoretically, uh, this is uh, how things are going on. 
in audio signal processing, for instance, maybe uh, this would be an issue. So now we can come back to the discrete resampling. The discrete resampling is <coughs> a, a nice uh, thing which helps us to change the rate of uh, your signal. If your original signal is, let's say, 1,000 samples, and if you cannot just transmit those 1,000 samples within one second to the other side, you may need to resample your uh, data, which is sort of compression at, at a cost, of course, by uh, omitting every other signal, and you make it uh, uh, length 500. And 500 samples, if your bandwidth is okay, maybe can be transmitted to the other side. So, resampling is usually a telecommunications issue. It's a stage of um, compression or reducing the amount of data. Um, but its Fourier domain analysis is critical for us, so we need to do it. And we need to start from again one dimensions, and we will extend everything to. Uh, two dimensions, two images. The, um, the situation happens like this. Suppose that you have, okay, let me draw in green. Um, you have this discrete time signal. Okay. We will do the discrete resampling in two steps. We will first, so uh, this thing is, let's give a name to it, it's X of N. The first step of uh, resampling is to uh, get rid of some of the samples periodically, uh, and we are going to denote it by uh, from here to x sub, let's say, x sub two of n. <coughs> but I'm running out of notation, so let's put the two in parentheses like this, x sub in parentheses two of n. And that x sub two of n is obtained by simply getting rid of these odd samples, and we are getting or we are retaining, keeping only the even uh, samples, x of zero, x of two. So uh, by getting rid of these, I uh, make them zeros. I don't um, really get rid of them. I get rid of the values, but I insert zeros in, instead of that. So it's going to be like this. Sort of. kind of thing, okay? Um, so this is the first step that we will do. It's like uh, we are chopping uh, the samples and we are making them zeros. And from here, I'm going to uh, get x sub two of n without the parentheses, which is, as you may already guess, um, a avoiding the uh, zero uh, samples completely and making it like this. Okay, on the n axis, all of them are n axis, and this is zero, one, two, three four, five, six, seven. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is zero, one, two, three, four. As you see, uh, the, the final black signal is like the squeezed signal. But uh, X sub in parentheses two, the red signal is not a squeezed signal, it's just a perturbed signal. The relation between these three signals can be 
very easily achieved like this. Um, first, let me start with the Fourier transform of the green signal. So I pick the green pen. And it's going to be like this. Or uh, let me first uh, talk about the idea. From the green to the red signal, it's like multiplying with an impulse train. Just like multiplying a continuous uh, signal with an impulse train. Do you remember what we did? We uh, multiplied with an impulse train, but in Fourier transform domain, it corresponds to uh, convolving the Fourier transform of one signal and the Fourier transform of the other signal. Fourier transform of the green signal was uh, two pi periodic, of course, it has to be. Of course, there are, um, I, I just plot uh, two periods of that. One is around zero, the other one is around two pi. This is x of e to the j omega, the Fourier transform. Why am I writing it as capital X of e to the j omega? Maybe in order not to confuse with the uh, continuous time Fourier transform, uh, because uh, you may remember that in Oppenheim's classical signal processing book, it uses this kind of annotation for indicating the Fourier transform of discrete time signals, capital X of e to the j omega. It is X, capital X of omega, okay? Uh, and it's two pi periodic, and it looks like this. How about the Fourier transform of um, an impulse train, which is periodic with two, because when I multiply uh, with an impulse train with period, with period two, it will pick the sample at zero, it will pick the sample at two, it will pick the sample at four, but it will not pick or it will multiply the value at one, three, and five, and all other odd uh, positions uh, by zero. So I will get the red signal. So that's how I do the multiplication, term by term multiplication. So in the Fourier domain, I have to do a convolution. But in discrete time, the convolutions are uh, available for uh, only two pi. It's a, uh, the, the convolution duration is two pi because everything is two pi period. And the, um, the impulse train that I will be using, let me call it P of omega or P of e to the j omega, like this, which is the Fourier transform of the impulse train that I multiply the green signal. And that is, if it is periodic with capital N in general, it would be two pi over capital N summation delta uh, omega minus um, k times omega s. Omega s is, by the way, 2 pi over capital N. Um, and And this is uh, not from minus infinity to infinity. Excuse me, I will just disable this one. This much within one period of 2 pi, and then it repeats itself with 2 pi. So this is within 2 pi duration in frequency domain. So when you convolve x of e to the j omega with uh, p of e to the j omega, in frequency domain on the uh, frequency axis of omega, then um, you will come up with x sub in parentheses p of e to the j omega or x sub p of omega if you wish. It may look easier um, to look like this 1 over 2 pi. It's just the convolution uh, within a duration of 2 pi p of omega times x of uh, oh it's not omega this i must erase because it's like x of tau h of t minus tau so x of tau uh, instead of tau i have to use another term let me use theta 
which is the auxiliary variable of omega, and capital of x of t minus tau, which is omega minus theta, e to the j omega minus theta, d theta, which is d tau in the original uh, time domain convolution. This thing looks complicated, but actually it's like x of tau, h of t minus tau integrated d tau. Now, what does it make? It makes this from this green to the new axis for x sub 2 of e to the j omega will look like this. It will just make, if the down sampling is 2, it will just make one extra replica between the green samples. So these are the original samples at 0 and 2 pi, but it will make an insertion. Uh, it will make a replica of this thing uh, by one extra term, which will be here. Uh, maybe the position is not very symmetric. It must be right in the middle. Sorry for that. Clearly, we must have some further. Oops, what's. I must have some extra terms like this. So this is 4 pi. Now the uh, extra terms due to this convolution in Fourier domain appears at uh, just half of it, which is pi, and this is 3 pi. This is what happens um, when you get rid of every other sample and make them zeros. So this shape that I have drawn here is the Fourier transform of this x sub 2 of n. I'm making replicas. And notice that those replicas are at high frequencies. What are the high and low frequencies in discrete time? We have to know that. The low frequency is zero, but since everything is 2 pi periodic, so the low frequency is again at 2 pi and 4 pi and 6 pi or minus 2 pi. So all the red triangles are actually low frequency. But notice this fact that in the red signal x sub 2 of n it is positive zero positive zero positive zero positive zero and maybe sometimes negative zero negative zero it's a very high frequency that uh, abrupt oscillation corresponds to the highest frequency that you may get, come up with in um, discrete signals what's the highest frequency then of discrete signals the highest frequency of a discrete signal is pi that's why we have some extra shapes appearing at pi corresponding to abrupt changes. Of course, since everything is 2 pi periodic, whatever you have at pi, you must have it at minus pi, you must have it at 3 pi, you have it at 5 pi, etc. All uh, 2 pi further uh, replicas must also appear. So the blue shapes correspond to the incorporated high frequency. But now, from here, I must come up with a further Fourier transform, which is the Fourier transform of x sub 2 of n, the black one that you see there, this one. Now notice that we don't have those abrupt um, changes from positive to zero to positive to zero to positive to zero, etc. We don't have that. So I don't expect the Fourier transform of this signal to uh, contain some components at pi, like the one that we have for uh, x sub in parentheses two of e to the j omega, the red uh, Fourier transform, the red signals Fourier transform. For this one, we shouldn't have that, but the, the signal is 
squeezed. The signal becomes shorter. What does that mean? Remember the properties of the Fourier transform. If you squeeze in time domain, you stretch them out in frequency domain. Or conversely, if you stretch them out in uh, time domain, you squeeze in the frequency domain. They are inversely related. That is a property that we have. So what we really have is we must have a stretched version of the original uh, signal, uh, which comes from here, this signal. Let us draw a stretched version of it. How many times stretched? It is squeezed by twice, so I have to stretch the Fourier transform by twice. If this point is, let's say, A, then by stretching out, it will be now at 2A. This is the replica coming from the uh, central uh, red triangle. It's being wider. What happens to the one uh, that is blue around pi, the second triangle at, to the right? It is also stretched, <clears throat> but its center point will not be at pi, it will be at, of course, 2 pi. Like this. So this A comes from here. And this 2 pi comes from here. Then uh, the next uh, red, which was uh, originally at uh, 2 pi, will appear at around 4 pi, like this. So this is the Fourier transform of this black signal, narrower signal, which is the eventual downsample signal that we are looking for. And let's give a name to that. It is x sub 2 of e to the j omega. Now the problem is, what is the relation between this x sub 2 of e to the j omega and the original x of e to the j omega? How can we relate the, this green Fourier transform with the black Fourier transform? How are we going to do that? What's the relation between them? Well, the relation between them is, as you see, it's although we followed a few steps in between, it's easier. It's like every triangle or every Fourier shape, band limited Fourier shape, around its original point. For example, around uh, the the green triangle around zero becomes twice wider. Okay, originally it was. Uh, from minus a to a, now it's from minus 2a to 2a. So you just make it wider, around zero. And the other one, which was around 2 pi, is also becoming wider around 2 pi. But it, that doesn't mean that this thing um, is equal to, uh, how, how can I say it? Um, maybe I, I, I'm, I'm trying to stick to the same uh, notation. This is not uh, equal to uh, capital X of e to the j omega over 2. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say, which makes it twice wider. Because when you make this green shape twice wider, the one at 2 pi will. Uh, fly all the way to 4 pi and we will have nothing at 2 pi which is incorrect because we know that the Fourier transforms of all discrete time signals are 2 pi periodic so it cannot be 4 pi periodic for example we need something to appear uh, around 2 pi you can either do it by making this auxiliary shape which corresponds to the Fourier transform of uh, making every other sample zero 
and over there the blue ones now appear in between and when you make that shape twice wider then uh, it will give you the black Fourier transform shape so it's not equal to this one that's critical by the way there's also a scaling factor x2 of e to the j omega as i say is not equal to x of e to the j omega omega over 2 but it is actually equal to within a 1 over 2 factor and that comes this 1 over 2 comes from the fact that you are losing half of the energy of the uh, signal therefore uh, there must be a scaling factor of 1 over 2 and from the formula it comes the same way as well uh, with, with this 1 over 2 factor we have x of e to the j omega over 2 which appear at 0 and 4 pi and uh, 8 pi etc or minus 4 pi which is the stretched out version of this green Fourier transform it's there in the black figure but uh, the components around 2 pi 6 pi minus 2 pi etc they are missing so I have to insert uh, that component as well plus x of e to the j um, uh, should I put within omega or within um, uh, after uh, omega over 2 that's what I'm trying to think right now I think it is omega over 2 um, okay it's inside omega omega minus 2 pi over 2 so this makes a 2 pi shifted version so uh, what I'm saying is these components which are the wider version of the original are here but this component is here. It's the 2 pi shifted version of uh, the others. That's something that we must have to make everything 2 pi periodic. And this expression that I have written is the 2 pi periodic uh, expression. And we can generalize this. Generalize to down sampling with a factor let's say p okay um, then that would or <laughs> yp let's use n um, x sub n of e to the j omega it doesn't have to be down sampling by two it can be three it can be four etc that's what i'm trying to get we will have a one over n and since uh, the the frequency axis is st uh, stretched out uh, by a factor of n uh, it's in order to make it still two pi periodic i need now n minus one more um, expressions that I have to add to make it 2 pi periodic. And it becomes therefore a summation of, um, let's say like from zero to capital N minus one, capital X e to the J omega minus two pi uh, K over n so if you are down sampling by a factor of three it means that in the Fourier domain you have two extra components or a total of three components all right if you're sampling down sampling by two this summation runs from zero to um, one which means you have only two components and you will get this expression in short this is the critical down sampling 
formula in the Fourier domain or in frequency domain. And I have to confess that it's uh, already a little bit difficult. So how are we going to extend it to, uh, to images, to two dimensions? You may start understanding that actually um, what we are going to do is we are going to express uh, the, the time and frequency terms in the forms of vector notations, vectors having, um, for example, two samples for two dimensional images. And the frequency will not be e to the j omega, but it will be like uh, omega underscore, making it a vector, okay? But the summation will look pretty much the same or very similar, so uh, that you will be understanding. But you have to always keep in mind this essential formula for uh, downsampling. Upsampling, we didn't mention about that, but it is so easy that uh, you can easily um, generalize it. Let me put it like this. Upsampling is easy. X upsampled by a factor of n of e to the j omega is equal to the original uh, x of e to the j omegas and uh, multiplying omega. What does that mean? It means you are squeezing all the two pi periodic triangles, okay, here, 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 two pi periodic, you squeeze them all the way n times. That's what it means. You are squeezing in the frequency domain. When you squeeze n times in the frequency domain, it was originally 2 pi periodic. Now it becomes 2 pi over n periodic. Okay. But is it a problem? No, it's not. It's okay. Because this is also 2 pi periodic. Clearly, capital N is a, an integer, of course. Uh, you cannot upsample arbitrarily in discrete time. You have to uh, upsample or downsample by integer factor, factors. If you want to do a fractional upsampling and, uh, or downsampling, like if you want, need, let's say, only two thirds of your signal, then you have to first downsample by three and then upsample by two. That's how you obtain that. And upsampling in Fourier domain is simple, as you see. Except <coughs> in downsampling, especially, you have to be careful about um, the aliasing issue. Because when you downsample, as you see, let me repeat, in downsampling, you have these triangles. Let me draw some more around 2 pi, 4 pi, uh, 6 pi, etc. If you don't sample by 2, then every triangle becomes wider in, in their own position. So this will be twice wider. This will be 2 pi, and this will also be twice wider. And this, the other one will also be twice wider, etc. This is, let's say, 6 pi. So if everything is uh, becoming twice wider, uh, you have to be careful about these overlapping positions, which may cause al aliasing. Uh, and uh, the proper way of doing downsampling may require if this is an issue, and it is always an issue in image processing, by the way, you must first um, apply a low pass filter. You must make sure that your bandwidth of your original signal is not greater than pi over two, pi over two. So if this is pi over two, you first uh, low pass filter your signal to 
a band with of uh, a, a low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of omega c is equal to pi over two. You first apply this kind of a low pass filter to your signal, make sure to make sure that aliasing does not occur. But the low pass filter, of course, uh, disturbs the signal a little bit. But that is necessary because without this low pass filter, when you make a down sampling, you may be uh, getting a more severe attack, uh, effect uh, of aliasing. Aliasing is something very undesirable. Instead of that, you have to first blur out a little bit and then make it low pass, uh, make it um, down sampled or smaller image. In the uh, literature or in, on the internet, you will find a lot of uh, aliasing effects uh, of images when they are um, down sampled. A, a typical downsampling artifact may occur, for example, if you uh, try to downsample a checkerboard like pixel um, situation. For example, this is black or red, or uh, the next is white, red, white, red, white, etc. And when you downsample that one, it will be. All red. So you don't sample by a factor of two and it will become completely red. Otherwise, it was half red, half white, which is like pink, maybe. Okay, I'm talking about, I'm drawing the, the pixels here. Um, so when you down sample, you want something look, looking pink. So how will you do that? This is an aliasing issue. You first low pass filter and uh, have these pixels to be pink and then down sample by two now you will have pink pixels you have to do it this way otherwise shapes become awkward uh, color uh, saturations change, etc. Uh, aliasing is a very bad effect in uh, in image processing, and it's very undesirable. And it happens uh, in a lot of the times uh, if you have like high frequency uh, components, if your signal does not fit between minus pi over two and pi over two. For example, look at my shirt. If you can notice, it is uh, brown white, brown white stripes. And when I move a little bit. I don't know if you can notice, but there are some uh, undesirable and strange effects. That's because of sampling, okay, of this high frequency oscillation, which is uh, which can also be considered as uh, aliasing of images, aliasing in images, and we don't want that. So, in down sampling, you have to first apply the filter. If it is down sampling by a factor of two. So for this operation, then you have to use low pass filter at pi over two. If it is down sampling by a factor of three, then the low pass filter must be pi over three, of course. So you have to use, use low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of pi over n if you, n is your uh, down sampling factor, you have to do it that way. Otherwise, you come up with aliasing. Everything will be joining to one another in practice. Uh, in theory, I, I'm able to draw these band limited triangles and they do not overlap. There is no aliasing, but those are in practice impossible to obtain. When you take a look at the Fourier transform of any image or any signal, any real life signal, uh, they are not band limited. They have uh, extending uh, frequencies from minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, but they contain most of the energy around lower frequencies. Therefore, it's a necessity that you always use uh, a band limitation filter, a pre filter as a low pass to avoid uh, aliasing. Sometimes people also give a name of anti aliasing filter. For those things so you have to use the anti-aliasing filter that's uh, an important um, 
note that you have to take into account. Uh, I will stop at this point. Uh, we will meet at, uh, let's say, 10.50, okay? 10 minutes to 11 o'clock, in other words. And from there, we will proceed uh, with the information or extension of all this information that we get to two dimensions or multiple dimensions. How can we uh, extend the formulas to those things? Okay, so I will stop now. But if you have any questions at this point, we may try to answer. Otherwise, at 10.50, we will stop, start the uh, lecture again. So, any questions? All right, no questions as I see from you. So I'm stopping the recording for now. We will meet at uh, 10.50.